I am Sureka, working in the Department of Physics in Pratyusha Institute of Technology and Management. Now, today we are going to see a session on ultrasonics. So, this is being the subject there in engineering physics. I will introduce you about the introduction of ultrasonics and about the sound waves. So, as we all know, it is, we have so many types of waves, namely light wave, sound wave and so on. So, we know the electromagnetic spectrum also. So, this particular ultrasonic is actually a sound wave. So, it is going to have a frequency of greater than 20 kilohertz. It is a very high frequency wave and particularly the field of ultrasonics have applications in imaging, detection. It is having various applications in the medicine field and all. So, everything we will see in detail now. So, before going into the ultrasonics, the actual pictorial representation and the characteristics, we will see about a brief history of ultrasonics which will be very interesting. So, in the year 1929, you had the first person, Sokolov, he was the first person to say that ultrasonics was useful to find the flaws in metals. So, inside the metal you have any crack or any kind of small flaw, it can be de easily detected by the usage of the ultrasonic wave. So, then you had in 1930, Firestone and Simon, they discovered the usage of ultrasonic waves in the pulse echo technique. And in the year 1935, Mulhauser was the first person to say that ultrasonics can be used in detecting the cracks. This field, this is a, there is a special branch of engineering dealing with the detection of cracks in metals. It is called non-destructive testing. So, without going to uh, cause any damage to the specimen or the material, you will send only the ultrasonic wave and you will find where the flaw is or where the crack is. So, this is why we are going to see all this is because the ultrasonic waves are having so many applications. We need to know about the importance of why we are going to study the ultrasonic wave. So, this is the major uh, kind of engineering application also. So, if you know all of us are aware of the Titanic ship, okay. So, after the accident of the Titanic ship in 1942, Lewis Richardson was the first person to insist that there should be a device to detect the icebergs. So, you know. So, this is the Titanic ship that was built in 1912. So, this is the sinking of the Titanic ship. So, if you know, we know, we are all aware of the reason also. There was an iceberg there in the sea which could not be detected easily so that the ship was not able to turn in the, or change in a particular direction that it hit the iceberg and it got crashed. So, if at all we had a system where we can detect these icebergs, we could have prevented such massive accident. So, and you know how many people that tragically got inside also. So, after this Lewis Richardson said that there should be a device to detect this icebergs. So, people thought of ultrasonic waves to send inside the sea and that is how we uh, come across the sound navigation and ranging namely sonar which we all have studied in the younger classes. So, next is the ultrasonic wave. We are going to see about this a brief characterization. So, you know the frequency is going to be higher than 20,000 hertz. The propagation of sound waves is actually longitudinal. The mechanical displacement being in the same direction as propagation. And there should be always a medium for the sound waves to propagate. If there is no medium, there is no sound wave. So, depending upon the density of the medium only, the velocity of the sound wave keeps on being different. It, is, it will always differ. So, next if you see, the motion of these particles, the, uh, the particles inside the medium are caused by two factors. One is the pressure of the wave. The other one is the forces, the restoring forces of the molecules. So, if you see here sound waves. So, why I am going to give you a brief introduction on sound waves. So far, we have been seeing that ultrasonic wave is a sound wave. So, basically sound wave, it can propagate in two modes. This also we are all aware. One is the transverse mode, the other one is the longitudinal mode. So, the transverse mode, if the particles inside the medium propagates in a direction perpendicular to the direction of motion of the wave, it is called a transverse wave. So, imagine you are the, you are all there in a class, a class consisting of so many students and if you hear, uh, if you come across a principal just coming inside and giving an announcement, you immediately turn your head away showing your negative reaction. So, which means the particles inside the medium, namely the students inside the class are reacting in a direction perpendicular to the, to the direction of the principal coming inside. So, that is called a transverse wave. That is how, you know, the particles actually propagate. So, the next one is the longitudinal mode. So, the particles inside the medium propagates in a direction parallel to the direction of propagation of the wave. That is called longitudinal wave. 
So in this case, if you see instead of your uh, principal or if you have a melodious music coming inside, somebody is coming up with a favorite song inside the class, immediately you all turn your heads towards that song. So which means the students are vibrating in a direction or responding in a direction parallel to that of the music. So the particles, the students namely are behaving in a parallel direction. So that is how the longitudinal motion. So this is a pictorial representation. So if you see here, so this is the direction of propagation of the wave. These are the particles inside the medium. They are vibrating in a direction perpendicular to that of the wave propagation direction. So that is called transverse wave. And here this is the longitudinal wave. So if your wave propagation is going to be in this way, particles inside the medium will vibrate in a direction parallel along to that of your wave propagation direction. This is called longitudinal wave. So this is a pictorial representation of ultrasonic waves. So if you see here, I have classified only the sound wave based on the frequency. So we all know our human audible range, it starts from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So this is the human audible range. Sound waves having frequency lesser than 20 hertz are called infra infrared rays, I mean infrasounds. So namely we say the infrasonics bats emit sound waves actually in the frequency of 20 hertz, lesser than 20, 20 hertz, so they are called infrasonics. So now the sound waves having frequency greater than 20 kilohertz, it is called as ultrasonic wave. So if you see here, for the case of medical purposes and all, we are using a sound wave having frequency greater than 20 kilohertz. So if you have sound waves having nearly the frequency of 2 megahertz and above, it is used for many diagnostic purposes. So I think we are all very much aware of this ultrasound scanning. Every lady will actually undergo this. A pregnant lady will undergo a ultrasound, ultrasound scanning in the month of fifth month, okay? So that will confirm the baby inside the mother's womb and it will detect the uh, fetal heartbeat movement also. So you can confirm by this whether the heartbeat is normal for the baby. So now we have the production of ultrasonic waves. Ultrasonic waves are produced by two ways. One is the magnetostriction generator, the other one is the piezoelectric generator. So to understand these two, we should know first of all this magnetostriction effect and piezoelectric effect. So we will see one by one. So the first one is the magnetostriction effect. If you see this in 1842, James Prescott Joule, he observed this magnetostriction effect when he was analyzing some magnetic materials in the presence of current, he was able to observe this effect. So if you see here, um, to our surprise, you place any ferromagnetic rod between the pole pieces of the magnet, the rod changes its length. That is called magnetostriction effect. So the, it describes the property of ferromagnetic materials which causes them to change their shape when subjected to their magnetic field. And the rod starts expanding or contracting depending upon the material of the rod. So as an example, I can tell you, in the, in the, I mean in the case of nickel, the rod always expands and in the case of permala, it contracts. And if you see here, we now understand what is this magnetostriction effect. So if you see here, a ferromagnetic rod is placed between the pole pieces of the magnet, north and south pole. And if you see, the rod slightly changes its length. That is because of the domains present inside your ferromagnetic material. Anyway, it is a magnetic property of the ferromagnetic material that makes your rod to slightly expand or contract. Of course, it is going to be only in few microscopic dimensions. You cannot see this obviously. Using a microscope, we can see this change in length. So as I've given here, so this is the original length of the ferromagnetic rod. Microscopically, it is just expanding like this. So we understand what is the magnetostriction effect, but from here we have to produce the ultrasonic wave. The main concept behind this is the frequency of vibration of this rod, the frequency of vibration of this rod should match with the frequency of the applied magnetic field. In this condition, we have resonance. So resonance is something like a condition where you have the natural frequency matching with the applied frequency. So once we have resonance, the ultrasonic waves, namely the sound wave starts generated. So this is a circuit for your magnetostriction oscillator. It consists of a oscillating circuit together with your ferromagnetic rod. Okay. So 
we are going to provide the constant magnetic field or we are going to supply a constant magnetic field to this ferromagnetic rod. So this is the actual generator circuit which I will come again. We will first see the piezoelectric effect also, the other effect. So this is a piezoelectric and inverse piezoelectric effect. So this piezoelectric effect is again very much important because now we have many, 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 many devices which are being generated by the principle of this piezoelectric effect. So piezoelectric effect is nothing but some kind of special crystals or some kind of materials once you give an electric field, so here in this case if you see once I supply charges to any two sides, any two phases of the crystal, the other two phases starts developing a stress and strain. That is called piezoelectric effect. Similarly, we have inverse piezoelectric effect. Inverse piezoelectric effect is nothing but when we apply stress and strain on two sides, okay, or when we give a tensile stress or a compressive stress to any two phases of the crystal, the other two opposite phases will develop charges. That is called inverse piezoelectric effect. So if you see here, the inverse piezoelectric effect is actually used in your piezoelectric generator or piezoelectric oscillator. So such kind of effect was actually observed in 18th century by Curie brothers, Pyre Curie and Jakes Curie. They discovered this effect. Later on, the piezoelectric crystals were invented generating above the effect. So the examples of piezoelectric crystals are quartz, Rochelle salt, barium titanate and so on. So Japan and US together they were working on this piezoelectric effect and they devised many crystals which generated many more applications in the field of engineering and science. So if you see here, uh, the main principle behind your ultrasonic wave production is inverse piezoelectric effect. So this is the circuit on the magnetostriction oscillator as I explained only about the magnetostriction effect using that magnetostriction effect we have designed a oscillator circuit. So this oscillator circuit once we have a clear understanding we will know the uh, exact ultrasonic wave generation method. So if you see here this ultrasonic uh, oscillator method is nothing but first of all we should know what is an oscillator circuit. Oscillator circuit is actually composed of a transistor coupled with resistors and capacitors and mainly a tank circuit will be there in an oscillator circuit. So once we see a transistor coupled with a tank circuit, we can say that as an oscillator circuit. Tank circuit, what I meant here was the LC circuit, that is the inductance and capacitance. A tank circuit means a LC inductance and capacitance circuit. A transistor coupled with this is a oscillator circuit. So if you see here, this is the ferromagnetic rod. It is clamped at two ends firmly. This ferromagnetic rod is wound by a coil. This coil is going to have an inductance L1 and L2. So parallel to L1, we connect a capacitor, a variable capacitor C. And this tank circuit is fed to the collector of the transistor circuit. And if you see here, the coil from your L1, this is actually connected to the base of the transistor. So this actually provides the necessary feedback to this transistor. So we know that for any transistor, if we have a necessary feedback, it will amplify the output signals. And the emitter is grounded. So here we have used a NPN transistor for this connection. And between the collector and emitter, we have connected a DC source battery supply coupled with a milliammeter to measure the current. So this is all about the fabrication and connection of the, I mean just the construction of the circuit. Once we speak about the working, we can first say that once the DC source is switched on, we know there is a current starts flowing inside the transistor. And it will start, the same current is fed to the tank circuit and whatever EMF is induced here, Due to electromagnetic induction, the same EMF is induced here also. So this coil, the induced EMF inside the coil, it is bound over a ferromagnetic rod. So this actually applies or supplies the necessary alternating magnetic field to the rod. So what happens on increasing the current more and more using your variable capacitor, using the variable capacitor, the oscillations are actually built up in your tank circuit and if you see there, the current is flowing inside the circuit continuously because the induced EMF from here is actually again transmitted to the transistor. So this is kind of a closed circuit where we have oscillations inside the tank circuit 
we call this as sustained oscillations. That is, we maintain the oscillations inside the tank circuit throughout so that the ferromagnetic rod has been given the enough or sufficient magnetic field. So, what happens here is the rod is now starts to vibrate at higher currents what happens is the rod starts vibrating at very high altitudes. So, once the frequency of vibration of this rod matches with the frequency of the tank circuit, this is an oscillating circuit, we have resonance. Because we know early resonance is a condition where the natural frequency is matching with the applied frequency. So, here the frequency of the vibration of the rod matches with the frequency of the oscillating circuit. So, resonance is built up. At resonance, you have ultrasonic waves coming out from the two ends of your rod. So, at resonance, we can see that ultrasonic waves are emitted from the two ends of the rod. You know that ultrasonic wave is a sound wave. So, we cannot actually see or view or observe a sound wave. So, in that case, we need to have a detector which will detect the outcoming ultrasonic wave and it will show that yes, the coming out wave from the circuit is actually ultrasonic in nature. So, this is all about the, uh, I have given you the brief idea about a sound wave and very brief introduction about the ultrasonics and its production. Thank you.